Okay, well, hello, everybody. Um, we've hit the uh, 3.30 hour, so we'll go ahead and get started. I guess it's the 3.30 half hour. But um, anyway, I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm really excited about our, our session today. Um, the, the topic is, is truth in the classroom. This is our second ETE seminar of this fall semester. And it's also um, a faculty-focused special edition of the ongoing facticity series uh, that is brought forward by USU department heads to help generate a campus community where we can come together to discuss uh, the variable nature of truth. And so we'll come back to more on that soon. Um, I do have a couple of uh, announcements um, to make you aware of some new campus resources that are available for faculty and students uh, before we jump in. So um, I will uh, encourage you to please find them and share them as appropriate. So I'll pull them up here. The first um, is a website uh, and an accompanying campaign from the uh, Student Retention Service, the Office of Student Retention here at Utah State. It's called thrive.usu.edu. And you'll notice that when you came in next to the, the notebooks and the ETE stickers, there was also a bookmark for thrive.usu.edu. And um, this website provides uh, a series of, of resources and um, best practices for students uh, through each year of their USU experience. And you'll note that it also has resources for faculty and staff as well. So this has um, information for students on, you know, how do, I, how do I persist? How do I get by academically, socially, personally? Uh, and then Here's just kind of an example of some of the sorts of videos they have. Um, here, let's go to here. Uh, and I'm not sure this will play super well, but let's give it a whirl. So, for example, they have some information here on how to connect with faculty and uh, students sharing their own experiences working with faculty who are particularly helpful. And we don't have any audio, so I won't worry about playing this through, but there's, uh, there's some really great testimonials there. I'd encourage you to go check out this resource. The, uh, the second one that we'd like to make you aware of that's coming out um, is on studentconduct.usu.edu. And this is a site where you can find, over here on the left navigation column, information about how to assist students in distress. And so, um, you know, there's a, there's an, as you're aware, there's been an increasing awareness and focus on the prevalence of, of uh, mental health issues and sexual violence on college campuses. And faculty have asked how they can best respond to a distressed student or a disruptive student. And so this website provides, as you see here, um, indicators of things to look for, indicators of distress, resources uh, as to where you can um, direct students on campus for help, um, information about campus protocol, who you should contact and, and how to go about doing that, um, as well as additional information. Um, and uh, so definitely a, a good resource. You'll be getting an email on that with a, you know, a brochure and you'll be seeing some more information on that soon. So, um, so those are some good things to be aware of. Um, now onto the topic that brings us together today. Uh, which is Truth in the Classroom. So like we said, this is a special session of the Facticity series. And the purpose of Facticity, and I'll come just read this off of their materials as stated, is as follows. USU's department heads are sponsoring a year-long campus-wide initiative that will provide the campus community a setting in which we can come together to discuss the variable nature of truth. We will, uh, they will host four themed panel discussions over the year, two each semester. So there's one back on September 12th, and there's another one coming up, I believe, what is it, November? I should have written it down. 14th. 14th. Um, this interdisciplinary series will focus on the methods, tools, and evidence that a variety of academic disciplines use to determine the validity of claims. Each panel will include faculty and one moderator from a range of disciplines in addition to panels, uh, there will be workshops on strategies and best practices for faculty who want to engage with these issues in their courses. So if you want to see more information, uh, you can go to digitalcommons.usu.edu 
Um, and then it'll be facticity, F-A-C-T-I-C-I-T-Y. -I, um, I should have pulled that up, but go to digitalcommons.usu.edu slash facticity. Okay, now to uh, talk about our panelists here today, we have um, Dr. Timothy Slocum. He's today's panel moderator and one of the primary organizers of the Facticity series. He'll also introduce our panelists, uh, who include Norm Jones from the History Department, Rose Judd Murray from the School of Applied Sciences, Technology, and Education, Peter Crosby from the AAA office, who also teaches for the Political Science Department, Moises Diaz from the Sociology, Social Work, and Anthropology Department, Dallas Villanueva from the Engineering Education Department, and Tim Gardner from the Management Department of the Huntsman School of Business. So as you see, we are well represented across disciplines today, and we thank our moderator and panelists for being here. Um, now I'll turn the time over to Dr. Tim Slocum, who is the Department Head and Professor for the Special Education and Rehabilitation Department in the College of Education and Human Services. Um, here you go, Tim. Thanks. Um, I'll just stay out of the way pretty much and just introduce what we're going to do this afternoon. Uh, each panelist is going to give a brief five-minute opening statement, uh, and then we're going to have uh, questions and answers and discussion for the rest of the time. So I'll just start by introducing uh, Dr. Norm, Norm Jones, Professor of History from the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Yeah, do we, I think we've got the microphone. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, you're picking on me because I've been here the longest. Is that the... <laughs> I'm looking at a lot of old friends here in this room. Um, I teach the history of revealed truth. So when you teach the history of Christianity, you, you, you put that truth thing right on the table because, of course, for 2,000 years, people have been acting on a truth that they know is true. And they know it's true. <clears throat> so it's a truth claim that's based upon both experiential and indoctrinated ideas about what is truth. And of course it explains everything. So my job as a historian of people who think this way is to actually say to them, well actually it hasn't always been understood as exactly true as the way you think it is exactly true. And there's been an ongoing debate about this forever. So when you go into the history of Christianity, you're really having a conversation from the very first moment about the difference between subjective truth, which is the truth of faith, and objective truth, which is the observable facts about behaviors and relationship to that subjective truth. <clears throat> so you're always having to say to them, when you're talking about what people are doing because they believe this, we are not talking about the validity of the belief that they have in this. So I always start the course with a discussion of their religious pain threshold. Uh, years ago, one of my, our former students, who's now holds the cult of chair at Notre Dame, wrote me a great essay about this. He said, any time you study the history of religion, you confront your own religious pain threshold. Because it's guaranteed that no matter what you believe, and this is true for atheists as well as anybody else, no matter what you believe, at a certain point, the study of what other people believe is going to really bother you. And your particular group will have some points where you'll really feel bothered. <laughs> So how are we going to deal with this? We are not in the business of saying, you're all wrong. You know, the historians are going to tell you what's true. We are in the business of telling you about the evidence for the behaviors that gather around beliefs about truth. So we have to start with this laying down the ground rules about how that conversation is going to work. So, of course, the first thing you say is we respect everyone. And I guarantee you, no matter who you are, where you're coming from, Within about three minutes of time you open your mouth, I can figure out what your tradition is. It's just the way you talk. You know, uh, what you believe is true is going to inform all sorts of things about the way you behave, the way you talk. And if you ask a question that is too offensive to your colleagues, we will start pressing you on why we I can show you a hundred other examples of people who might disagree with you about that particular interpretation. Because we, we have to have this level playing field where everything is safe. The second thing that we have to do in the class is we have to deal with evidence. So experiential truth, revealed truth, uh, is a different, uses a different proof system than history. History says we haven't got a document, we can't talk about it. We can't interview God. There's no oral history for God. We don't know why God did this, so that's not the question. The question is, what do people think that God is doing? And that leaves a historical record. 
So we emphasize the algorithms that historians use to test what is happens in the past, not what is true about religion, but what is true about the past. Mm -hmm. And so it's the, the application of those algorithms. How do you take the evidence, analyze the evidence, derive from that evidence statements about the history of the belief? So we, uh, we work very carefully in the class to keep that apart. You, you have reasons for belief that are not historians' reasons for saying this is what happened in the past. You can be a historian and still have belief. And when it comes to the end of the class, I always say, okay, last day, ask me anything you want except one thing. I'm not going to tell you what the true church is. I know, of course, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> because the, the discourse in the class has to be around what does the evidence tell us that people have done because of their belief in this particular revealed truth. So that's how we try and walk that line between the subjective and the objective. Thanks. Next, Dr. Uh, Rose Judd Murray, who's a STEM educator in the School of Applied Sciences, Technology, and Education in the College of Agriculture and Applied Sciences. Thanks. I'm not quite a doctor, but I'll take it, Tim. <clears throat> I could listen to Dr. Jones all day. That stuff's really fascinating to me. So I teach undergraduate uh, non-science majors, and the course that I've taught for the past since 2015 has been um, science, technology, and modern society. And I love being with undergraduates because where they're non-science majors and taking a science class for a GE course, I find that they have waited until the last possible <laughs> second to take this class and they are not excited. I have at least three students come into my office in tears and say, I can't do science, I'll never make it. But I, I love the unexpected nature of that. But we begin every semester by talking about perceptions. And this is my perception beach ball. This is something I start with every semester. And I hold this up in the beginning of class. And I say, Mitch, what numbers do you see from where you're sitting? Right? And he's 2, 10, whatever it is. And then we say, you know, Julie in the back, what numbers do you see? And then you know, Harrison, what numbers would you see over on this side? And of course, I can see 14, 6, 5. We all see a different perception. And that becomes your truth. That becomes your individual truth that you have. And that's shaped by your culture and tradition. It's shaped by our bias. It's shaped by the individual experiences that we have. And that little t truth becomes valuable because we can't deny that that is in existence, just exactly what. Dr. Jones was just saying that those truths differ associated from, you know, how we view and see the world. The kicker is, is that we want to compare that to what becomes how we view scientific truth and how we view truths that we can actually prove and the objective truths that we can prove. And I think having the students experience and begin to understand that the syntax matters. And just to give you one idea of looking at, I ask them, you know, what they think a theory, you know, when somebody says, this is a theory, tell me about your theory, and they assume that that means something that's speculative, you know, it's a good guess, it's a good idea, maybe they put together a little bit of research, but we talk about how in science, a scientific theory is actually, you know, conclusive, non-speculative forms of information where we have calculated that information and we can come to a real answer, and that the understanding of the big T versus the little T uh, can really be defined within the discipline of whatever you're talking about. Um, when we have that information, um, the other thing that they really struggle with that we try to talk about is that in science, there's only so close we can get to 100%, right? Even when we talk about things that we've established and we rely on those theories, gravity and evolution and all those aspects, you know, as soon as we have new information that could change that, we can modify that. And so we have to talk about how does that play into your perception and your bias and how you see the world and how um, you perceive what that truth becomes and that it, the truths that we bring together through analysis are, are definitive. And we do that by... Um, I really love the resources and materials from the Foundation for Critical Thinking. And I, this is something that I came across years ago, but I love their analysis of three different types of questions. 
And I really try hard to get my students to look at this in terms of the questioning and how they build questions and how they ask questions in the class. Um, I think we allow our students to ask a lot of questions in class, but there are very few courses and very few uh, times when we help our students learn how to build a really good question. And what is breadth and scope and clarity and all of those elements that make a really good question. So we talk a lot about how do we build a good question and how we ask a good question. And then what can those questions tell us? And um, we talk about three different types of questions. Type one questions are what we call one system questions where we can use reasoning and analysis and information and we can pull all that together and we get a correct answer, a yes, no, two plus two equals four. Type one system questions always have a right answer. We can have type two type questions that are completely subjective. We call those no system. We can call those no system questions where I ask Peter, do you like peanut butter sandwiches? It depends. Well, that's the wrong answer. <laughs> it's completely subjective, right? There's no answer that's right or wrong. That's just his opinion. And then the last system, or type three or multi-system questions are ones that we ask where, yes, we're going to build information, we're going to draw reasoning, we're going to use our critical thinking skills, but in the end, a multi-system question is very complex. And complex questions uh, can only result in a judgment call. It's better or it's worse, right? We can't really define what the correct answer is. And to, so to help them see that by questioning and by seeing that some questions are never really going to get to a right answer or really ever going to get to what becomes your truth, where our truths aren't going to match up. So we talk a lot about, um, can you tell me what kind of a question that is? Or how could I ask that? Is there a way to ask that question? where I wouldn't get such a subjective answer, where maybe I could get it to move from a, a type two type question to a type three type question, or from are there aspects of that question where you can draw out a type one answer, but maybe there are elements of complexity that won't allow for anything beyond a judgment call. I also think it's really important to kind of label things as whether they're complicated or whether they're complex. And uh, complicated and complex, I noticed that my students use those words interchangeably. But when you really look at what those words mean, something that's complicated can have multi-systems and moving parts. Uh, but at the end of the day, a complicated equation, a complicated problem, a complicated scenario can give you a type one answer. You can still, you can do a calculus equation and still get x equals two or whatever your slope is or all that kind of stuff. But in complex situations, again, we lean more to those multi-system answers where it just becomes a judgment call. And so for them to really break this down in terms of what are my questions and then how does my personal experiences and my own truth how does that manipulate how I ask that question, how I see, how I want that question to be answered? That gives them a, a, it almost levels the playing field in the classroom where we see students who uh, may have really strong biases when they first come into the class, but as they learn to ask questions in different ways and to analyze when other people ask them questions to break those things down, that's become really meaningful. And I have to mention, it's just something that I've done this last semester. I try, I took uh, Travis Thurston and Courtney Stewart did a workshop at the ETE conference. And they had students, um, I've kind of brought it into my classroom where we have them analyze their responses to questions in the class. And they have to analyze the responses based on Bloom's taxonomy. So they have to try to Think about how they're thinking. So are they using, are they just remembering? Are they trying to analyze? Are they trying to make connections in their own life? And just by having them think about the process of thinking, I've really seen their ability to determine what is fact and what is truth and whether this is a complicated thing or something that's more complex. Um, sorry, I've got a couple of notes here. Um, 
I, we, I spend a lot of time talking about the type of thinker that they want to be. And I have some, again, that foundation for critical thinking. It's just criticalthinking.org if you want to check out some of their resources. But they detail heavily what kind of a thinker, uh, what kind of attributes make you a low level, a mid level, and a high level thinker. And I have the students analyze what kind of thinking they're doing. Are you just basing your response to this article or to this information based on a gut reaction, a low level, you're not consistently fair, you might be selectively reflective. Some of those things kids are like, yeah, I don't really have anything to back it up. When they say things in the class, like, you know, they may say something uh, confrontational or something that uh, might be painful for other students, uh, rather than, you know, delving into that, we can, we can say, well, why are you having that reaction? And a lot of times it comes to, I'm just having a feeling, like I don't like what you're saying. I don't have anything to back it up with. Then we can say, well, what kind of thinking is that? Rather than putting that student on the spot in terms of their opinion or what their experiences may be, they can recognize my bias might be driving the way that I'm feeling about this conversation. And there's such great stuff on the internet about that. I don't know how many of you saw that 104-year-old woman that drinks three Dr. Peppers a day. And it's a great example of egocentric bias. The students love that. Um, lastly, I think engagement matters. I don't want to go over time, but um, there's, I think engagement really matters. And I, on the ETE website, I put a list of ways that I engage students beyond the Socratic method with decision matrices, future wheels, even readers theater. I took a bunch of online commentaries, uh, comment scrolls on, on certain topics that related to scientific truths and scientific theories. And we actually role play those just as they swear words and all, just straight up, we just, the kids always bleep them out because they're, they're good kids. But, uh, <laughs> you know, they, um, just to have them do those forms of engagement, get them really thinking about how we communicate with each other for forms of truth. So if you want to check out those, I, I put those on the ETE website if you want some of my strategies that I use for student engagement in a classroom. Those can be really fun. Thanks. Next we have Peter Crosby, from the, who's an instructor in political science from the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, so we deal in type three questions, and that's pretty much all we talk about in my class. I teach USU 1300, uh, which is about 150 to 200 freshmen. They are generally not engaged with the topic because it's a course they are, have a burning desire to take. They typically take the class because it meets a gen ed requirement. Um, and it's an interesting environment uh, that I actually really enjoy because from my perspective, freshmen are probably the best students on campus to teach in general. They're the most enthusiastic, they're the most willing to learn, and they're the most willing to go ahead and check what they thought they knew in light of new information, which I have found that the older I get, the less likely I am to do. Um, and the more we educate ourselves, I think the less likely we're willing to do that as well because there's a, a cost burden there with reevaluating our assessment or our personal belief system. Um, my course focuses on politics in America, political institutions, and why they exist the way that they do. So what were some of the factors that led to people making decisions that created the institution that exists today, and why would they have made that choice? Um, and so it forces students to think about their history in a way that's sometimes uh, critical and reflective in a way that they perhaps haven't engaged with before. But kind of the meat of the course when we get to truth is the realization that politics is not a hard science. Um, and I will come out and say that, and anybody in my field will go ahead and admit that readily if they're a decent political scientist. We're not a hard science. We deal with subjectivity on a regular basis. And so coming to what we believe to be truth is very much um, something that draws on personal experience and on self-reflection and on the kind of education and environment you've been exposed to. And most of these students come in with some preconceived notions of how politics works or they have preset ideas on what they think is right or wrong in a political structure or around policies that the government makes. And one of the very first things that we tell them is I really don't care what you think because I don't. I don't care what you think. What I care about is that you know why you think the way that you do. That's what I'm interested. 
in, in getting to the heart of. Your opinion is yours. And in politics, hopefully there's a, a range that allows multiple opinions into that conversation. And so what's not important is to say, this is what I believe. What is important is to say, this is why I think the way that I do. And we approach that from a very rational standpoint. Um, I don't know if I'm a masochist or a good instructor. The uh, it, committee's out on that decision. <laughs> but my students write seven three-page papers. And then they write a, a final paper that's five to seven pages in length. And um, that's only possible because I have two graders that allow me to keep my sanity. But those papers are designed around uh, just a, a core thesis statement. We give them seven topics for the final. They go ahead and choose their own. And we tell them straight up front, again, I don't care what your opinion on the topic is. You don't receive points based off of your opinion. You receive points based on how you have defended that assertion. And so we talk about what it means to come to an understanding of why you think the way you do. So we encourage research. We don't have a set textbook for my course because we make them cite uh, at least two to three academic sources for every paper they turn in, which means if they're doing their research properly, they're reading anywhere between three to seven academic journal articles for every paper that they submit for my class, um, which is not a small uh, research burden for a freshman student. Um, I, I think it pushes them, but we have seen some pretty remarkable things in our students in the fact that they're willing to engage with the content and they're willing to go ahead and start exploring why they think the way that they do. And that kind of leads us to the second thing that we tell them on day one, which is you need to have the moral courage to look at your own personal convictions. And if the evidence suggests that your opinion on a topic does not coincide with the facts that you are able to find, you change your opinion on the topic. And that is something that we encourage them to think about. Again, we're not concerned about what their opinion is. We are concerned about why they think the way that they do and helping them come to an understanding of how they defend that personally and why that exists. And maybe for them, the opinion is not based in fact. And as an instructor, I can't change that. That's certainly up to them. But hopefully, we have exposed them to the ideas that conflict with that. And they understand why people think the way that they do in contrast to their own opinion on a topic, um, which is why our classroom has some four civility standards. It's something that we take very seriously. We want a space where somebody can talk about gun control or can talk about the death penalty or can talk about abortion or any other topics mm -hmm. that we find in general society you know, fairly inflammatory. And they need to feel like they can express their opinion and when someone disagrees with them, it's not because they find the individual morally reprehensible, but because they have some kind of experience that suggests their opinion is different and they have some validity to that opinion. And that allows them, hopefully, to bounce off of each other in a way that allows both parties to gain a different, more nuanced perspective of the issue. Um, when I said we deal in type three questions, that's, that's really what the class focuses on because there is nothing in the American political system that has an easy yes or no. Um, and I'm a firm believer that if somebody says that's the case, they're probably running for office. Um, <laughs> it's just, that's not how the American <laughs> domestic society works. I mean, we're, we're complicated people with a lot of different experiences and we have different solutions to a problem. And some of those solutions coming, at different, uh, coming from different perspectives might be equally valid in the intended result. Does that mean that one solution is right or one is wrong? That's not for me to tell my students. That's for them to make a decision on themselves. And they need to do that, hopefully, after they have committed enough time to understanding why someone would think that's a good solution, why they would think they would want to implement it that way, and what they hope to see the results be. Um, so again, my course is very much not about telling students what to think, because I don't think that's a good way to start college but it's about helping them understand why they think the way that they do. And truth for us is, is subjective in, in the political sphere. It very much is subjective. It comes down to your personal belief system and it comes down to hopefully what you look at in the world around you and say this, this fact-based evidence is what is suggesting that my, my belief system is a valid one within this political sphere. Um, and so that's what we encourage in our students. It's, it's a fantastic course um, from my perspective because I'm biased on it. But I think that it does offer opportunities to engage with difficult topics in a way that allows students to say, 
I might disagree or they might disagree with me, but we both are still decent people at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next we have Moises Diaz, who's a clinical assistant professor in sociology, social work, and anthropology in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Thank you. Do I need the microphone or can I just speak? Terrific. Okay. Well, the first thing I want to acknowledge, well, beautiful um, introduction from the other colleagues here. And um, I think this is in conjunction with the hard work that comes from all those that teach the general education courses. So there's a lot that precipitates any of what we're talking about. And so I, I think hats off to those that do that difficult work. And apparently you're one of them, right? So thank you. Um, quickly, I'll just mention what my career has been. I've, um, I'm a social worker by training, and so I'm a, a clinical faculty member. Um, I've done supportive work with families, work with youth in custody, supportive work for child protective service workers, mental health, psychosocial rehabilitation, school social work in secondary and in post-secondary settings, supportive counseling with children. And um, in all of this, I have encountered people that face all sorts of life challenges, um, abuse, neglect, anxiety, um, homelessness, food uncertainty, trauma, violence, substance abuse, et cetera. Um, so I train students in my profession now to be practitioners, to go out and uh, work with people across the, the spectrum, whatever you find in society and in life. All backgrounds, all worldviews, all social groups, all experiences, and we work from cradle to grave, as they say, uh, metaphorically. Um, in the hospital setting alone, we work with someone who might be experiencing a fetal demise in the neonatal intensive care unit with premature infants. In the emergency department, you see people from every walk of life. It spares no one um, in that context, rich, poor, young, old. Um, so preparation for social work practice can include the skills to counsel young children and to be in touch with their reality and their truth, all the way to seniors at end of life and everyone in between. Uh, from a more objective, what we would probably consider more objective standpoint, we intervene using evidence-based practice principles and scholarship that in, informs uh, our guiding theories. And even with that, uh, I think, context, you can still have an agenda. So what we're referring to as truth is still, I think at some level, potentially subjective, even if we're calling that objective. We look at societal trends, qualitative and quantitative information, to prepare ourselves to engage with people, to understand and assess their need, facilitate behavioral change, and to evaluate the outcomes of the service that we provided. We've been asked to share what teaching strategies uh, related to objective and subjective truth we use in the classroom or that I would use. And I would say that as a human service professional, you're routinely going to deal in the subjective. And so in a classroom discussion, it's almost useful quite often to deal in that realm because you're dealing with people's perception of situations. So a fundamental value of our profession is to start where the client is, where they think they are and where you and your professional judgment think they are. So both of those matter. So you assess where they are as a starting point to create targeted change, positive change in the lives of those you, that you serve. Um, so our understanding of this subjective element is, is vital. I don't see it as, um, again, I think many people have said in one way or another that it's not necessarily a bad thing. Like it, we're on the same, <laughs> same from a similar sheet of music. Um, to promote successful life change and behavioral change, who you're working with has to be invested in the process. If any of us in this room or across the distant sites thought about someone telling you what to do versus you choosing what to do, I'm sure that it doesn't take a rocket scientist to decide which one you'd be more motivated by. And so thus it is. So you must, as a practitioner, be skilled in ascertaining what people's truth is then, so to speak. A challenge that we face, and when I think of classroom discussions, uh, certainly human behavior, um, it's not one plus one equals two and two plus two equals four. Lots and lots of different variables all the time. And so there are all, all sorts of different possible explanations that, uh, that can come into the picture. People, we all relate to the world based on what we have in common with groups or situations or what we feel is our common understanding, which I think also resonates 
said already. So when I think of some classroom strategies to um, maybe enhance some thinking around these issues, to incentivize or priorities, prioritize uh, the use of our guiding literature and our signature models, um, and to encourage students to toil with those prior to coming to the classroom. That's nothing new. I think we all do that at some level, but anything I can do pedagogically to get them to toil with the questions beforehand is going to help. And have students share as often as possible in different ways, whether they break up into small groups or have an opportunity to again, not only have a safe context uh, to, to share in, but to have the sense that their opinion matters. So I think that students come up with wonderful insights all on their own and in groups all the time. Um, critical thinking, as has been mentioned in so many ways already, is, is really the priority. Have students journal about difficult content, content um, in the classroom setting and reacting in front of your peers and in front of a faculty member is not always the ideal way to learn. And so I will oftentimes have students journal about what causes them angst or what they're toiling with in, in the curriculum. And they may not have to confront that in front of everyone, but they might get some feedback and that still enriches subsequent discussions. So they don't always have to share openly, they at least have to reflect consider. In spontaneous situations, acknowledging as their faculty member that considerations are, are difficult and that perhaps we can address it further at another time. And I think that there's some aspect of that that um, is a way to model uncertainty, model the fact that there's not always a quick and easy answer, that you don't always have the metaphorical silver bullet for everything that comes up in class, and the fact that it's the opposite of what students come to see teachers as. They expect you to have that sort of precise response to everything. That's not how life always works, especially not in the human services. So those are just some reflections. Thank you. Next, uh, Idalis uh, Villanueva, uh, Assistant Professor in Engineering Education in the College of Engineering. Hello. <clears throat> Can you guys hear me? Great. Um, I, uh, like you said, I am an assistant professor in engineering education, um, which means that I teach both engineering and education <laughs> classes. Um, and um, my research interests are in hidden curriculum in engineering. Um, while hidden curriculum has been widely explored in education, it hasn't been um, done in engineering per se. Um, and so for, for just to briefly describe hidden curriculum, Hidden curriculum are the lessons that you learn in a classroom that are not necessarily tied to the classroom itself. Classroom meaning content, syllabus, lectures, presentations, and so forth. It's the other lessons that you learn from that. Um, and uh, the lessons that they learn informally or implicitly will guide how students' perceptions about a given field or a given content matter will, will occur. Um, and so I, I teach an introduction to engineering class, and one of the things that we do is um, similar to some of my colleagues is talk about perceptions. And I actually take perceptions from a back-in-time perspective, historical perspective, but also from a future perspective. So um, one of the activities I do with my students is, tell, you know, if you had your grandmother sitting next to you, could you describe to her what is engineering in your own words? And so I have this activity where students explain to each other what they think the engineering field is about. Um, and in my research, I've developed a framework called the Engineering Professional Identity Framework, where I take students' responses and sort of uh, try to match it to timelines of the engineering profession to see where they stand in that perception. Um, and it's, uh, it's, I've done it for four, time, four semesters now, and it's been very interesting to see how students realize that their perceptions are way back in time. I mean, talking 1500s, 1600s <laughs> type of perception of the field. And um, so, so we, we do a, a brief explanation of the history of engineering. And then I ha ask a follow-up question. And I ask them, well, how do you see yourselves as an engineer in the future? Right? And so then they have a discussion about that. And uh, we, we segue that discussion with, well, what do you think engineering is? Is it a profession or is it a function? And so it's a really interesting question to ask them because 
um, if, if uh, people that are in the engineering education world uh, will, will look into, it's actually more of a function rather than a profession <laughs> because there's not a required um, internship experience as part of the formal curriculum. And so the students have to really take a defragment engineering and look at it from function. So, okay, so what does a design engineer do? What does a manufacturing engineer do and so forth and with that exploration of uh, the future of what they're going to be doing um, we bring them back to the present and we have them look at assumptions um, what assumptions are you making about a given field what assumptions did you make about the past what assumptions did you make about the future and who's guiding those assumptions um, and it's interesting to see that a lot of times a lot of these assumptions are this hidden curriculum, these implicit messages. Sometimes they get it from their peer students. Sometimes they get it from parents. Sometimes they get them from a TA in the classroom. And so um, I use that experience to help uh, students uncover expectations um, by those explicit players in the classroom. So I uh, mentor my TAs to help uncover hidden curriculum in the classroom. So, um, sometimes students don't feel comfortable talking to the professor, um, but maybe the TA is a good point of contact. So, so I train the TA to help communicate some of my expectations of the class to the students. If they have questions about syllabus, if they have questions about course content, um, I also allow the opportunity for students to look at the survey, uh, for example, formal course content and have them uh, ask questions about it. So I, I, I do a quick uh, quiz in the beginning of the semester and I say, what questions do you have about the syllabus? You know, what, what can I answer for you? Um, and in the same way, um, I use that to sort of open up uh, venues of communication between the students and myself. The other thing I do, and I do it in another class, um, is uh, I have a, I teach a class on online education. It's a graduate class and I, have the students in that class see themselves as future educators. Um, and I present scenarios, case scenarios of common hidden curriculums that you see um, uh, in the literature. For example, one example is um, students many times come to the office of a professor saying, I don't know why I got a, a B in the class. But then when you look at the syllabus, nowhere in that syllabus was there an explanation or a breakdown of how a grade was um, calculated, right? So, mm -hmm. so the students themselves don't know how the grading happens, but then there's this assumption by the instructor that, oh, it's intuitive, the students should know how to calculate their own grades. Um, so, so it's an interesting dynamic. So I have the grad students look at themselves in the future and sort of put themselves in the position of themselves as future instructors, but also put themselves back in time in the position of themselves as students and how would they have perceived mm -hmm. the information that they got um, so it's a, it's a little bit of an interesting dynamic, so I really appreciate what the, the, the group said here because it's certainly a combination of that. Thank you. And finally, Tim Gardner, Associate Professor of uh, Management um, in the Huntsman School of Business. Great. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, just a quick uh, background about myself. Uh, this is, uh, I've never taught undergraduate. We all teach in different ways, and we all are different in certain ways, but I've never uh, had a chance to teach uh, undergraduate students. I've always taught graduate business students, whether it's uh, MBA students, uh, or we also have this Master of Human Resources program uh, at, the, at the business school. Uh, so I feel a little bit about a place that I feel like I'm, I'm soaking up, and I'm really uh, sad that I don't have that, that opportunity. Uh, just to, to kind of put my remarks in context, uh, as I looked over the purpose of this discussion, I want to emphasize that where I'm coming from is to uh, curriculum and processes to help students make informed judgments in the areas of objective and subjective truth in the classroom. Uh, let me start off with talking a little bit about what I teach. I teach management classes broadly. Uh, my favorite definition of management is the transformation of resources into utility. That notion of utility uh, really drives what happens and what, uh, what goes on in the business school classroom and what our students expect. Students come into the business school classroom to get a job in an area for which they're not currently qualified, to get a promotion in their own company, uh, or maybe to get a promotion or a better job into another company. And so uh, discussions of truth in the classroom really revolve around what's useful, what can I do 
on the job to get the job and get promoted? What's going to work? Uh, and really less of a thought inside the classroom of what's true or not true, and certainly almost no consideration of what's subjectively true and what's objectively true. Uh, I am stereotyping the business students a little bit, uh, just a, a little bit for humor. Certainly our, our accounting students, our finance, our economic students come from a, a, a really strong scientific background with a body of knowledge that they're going to use and they're going to be very interested in those uh, uh, truth claims, less subjective uh, claims, but still the focus is on utility and, and what works. Uh, what I want to talk about is uh, th this idea of what I see in the classroom is, is how do I confront this in management? Uh, everyone thinks that they have an expertise in management, and I, I kind of relate a little bit to Professor Jones. They walk into your class thinking they already know, uh, and there's not much that they can learn from your class. Uh, in my class, the students come in the classroom feeling like, uh, that they just need to reflect on what they've seen in previous managers, what's uh, the best business books are saying, what's Google doing, what's Nike doing. Uh, if I just do that and I don't break any laws, uh, I'll be fine. <laughs> and so this idea that there's a body of, of pretty strong scientific knowledge about how to make good management decisions, how to manage people to achieve the outcomes that you want, is really seen as touchy-feely and really not all that useful and it's certainly not going to apply to their lives. And so the, the route I take in my classroom is to confront these students uh, with uh, uh, live uh, activities, simulations, experiments in the classroom. Uh, and I won't detail all of those, but in general, I try to get the students to make a decision, to say what they would do and then use a higher bar of truth to show uh, that maybe what they were doing wasn't going to work. And like I said, many examples, I hope I get a chance to talk about them, but the one example I'll talk about is uh, making, making hiring decisions using the interview process. And there's a large body of literature, 100 years of, of scientific literature, that there are better and worse ways to use interview questions to find out if people have the competencies uh, that are required for the job. And very good reliability, good validity, good decisions of whether you're going to hire someone that does or does not perform. It's not a matter of, oh, I feel this is a good hiring decision. It's, uh, I'm gonna rate them on their future performance now and I'm going to compare that to their later performance. A large body of literature on that. What I do, uh, one of the several things that I do, is I use uh, videotaped uh, video recordings of different people in different interview contexts. I manipulate what I show them, uh, and in the end, I force them to make uh, a common rater error, a common uh, heuristic bias that, that people make, uh, and then confront them with that to show that what they did deviated from what they really expected that they wanted to do. Uh, and I've, like I say, I've got several examples of that, but what that does is that for, by, by sort of forcing their gut feeling against a higher truth claim of what the science shows and how they're, they're not making decisions in what they want to do, uh, I find them much more willing to be, uh, be uh, uh, much more willing to take on what I'm trying to teach, to practice what I teach, uh, and then to use it uh, in the workforce. So thank you. Thank you. Amazing set of ideas across the panel here. Uh, everybody's touched on aspects of objectivity and subjectivity. So maybe to get the discussion going, we can touch on that a little bit more. Uh, clearly, objectivity does not guarantee truth, and subjectivity is not in any way the opposite of truth. So these things aren't necessarily in polar opposition. I wonder if you guys can talk some more about how you've addressed different ways of knowing, treating subjective and objective as simply different rather than in, uh, in opposition to one another. Anybody? So there's a Stephen Colbert clip <laughs> that talks about truthiness. Um, and I appreciate the candor with which that, that clip shows discussions are possible around um, how people perceive the world around them. Truthiness was kind of this idea, if you're not familiar, that uh, President George W. Bush had that he could feel it in his gut, right? There, there's truthiness here. Um, and so he would very much an instinctual kind of person when he was making choices. Um, what's interesting about that is there is some research that suggests that we don't really understand instinct as well as perhaps we should. And we don't understand uh, inspiration perhaps as well as we should. And so that's not to say that inspiration is bad or that instinctual actions are bad. We just need to understand when they're most effective and how to apply them. 
And so within the, within the course, we do talk about, for example, you're going to make a decision sometimes based off of how you feel. So you're going to make a moral judgment. And that's, that's not objective truth. That's subjective based off of your own definition of morality. That doesn't mean it's good or bad. You just need to understand why you're making the choice that you're making. Um, and so I, I always think about truthiness when we talk about subjectivity and objectivity. For me, um, uh, different ways of knowing requires different ways or options by which knowledge can be shared. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have students have several options of homework submissions, for example, multiple means of representing that knowledge, right? So some people might be very good at writing, but others might be more artistically inclined. And so offering options to share that knowledge, I think, will allow us to understand and address those different ways of knowing. I tell my students to go pray about it. <laughs> <laughs> because that, that, that's, you know, teaching the history of, of revealed religion, that's a very direct way of saying there is a different way of accessing a truth, which is a subjective truth. Because they can't go pray about it and still get the exam questions right. Well, they might, but we don't have any evidence of this. But, <laughs> but, but it, it's that getting them to confront that they have a way, religious people have ways of knowing that are not the same as the ways of knowing of science. And the science has its limitations. That, that it, it's doing something different than subjective systems. And subjective systems don't have to be governed by the same rules until you enter into the public conversation about what really is scientifically there. And then you have to understand the rules of the scientific analysis. I feel like uh, in my classroom, and I think in many school business school classrooms, you see a, a differentiation between teaching the students how to do it. What does the research say? What's general practice? What does the evidence say? Uh, and then how are they going to implement this when they go to work? Because let's say they now have a better understanding. I'll keep with my example of interview questions, but there's many different uh, techniques we can talk about. Uh, many, many people, very few people, quite honestly, uh, are aware of the re reliability and validity of, of, of correctly designed interview questions. Uh, and even if they know it, they don't like to use it. People in the field really believe they can make gut decisions about hiring uh, and making those decisions. So students are, are, in a sense, going to be in the role of a professor. They're going to know the right technique. And to get that implemented uh, in their organization is going to be aware of what other people are thinking of, what's objective truth and what's subjective truth, and how to make that case. And uh, one of the, the, the techniques I use to talk about that implementation is there's a, a fantastic story taking place. I think this is in the early 1900s. Uh, there was an, uh, uh, an American who figured out how to better shoot cannon from one ship into another ship. I mean, he was objectively able to show that his technique, his invention, uh, was much better, and it was able to, to result in a higher degree of accuracy. But even with the data, even with the reports, uh, the Navy, from the mid-level all the way up to the top of the Navy, was unwilling to, to adopt his innovation. And so we talk about how you can't just say, well, I, I had this class in grad school. I, I did this activity in my, in my class. I wrote a paper about this, uh, that they're going to have to make those judgments and, and use, in, in some ways, social processes, change management processes to get people involved uh, and willing to implement those techniques in, the, in, their, in the work setting. I just want to add, you know, different ways of knowing. I think that's why allowing your students to discuss and to discuss yeah. in different sizes of groups, whether that's a pair share, a small group, a larger group, an online discussion. I try to really rotate those things because what I find is that our, our students have a, there's a, a, a dominant culture at Utah State and, and that's fine. It can be a great thing in the classroom, but <clears throat> they need opportunities to be exposed to other forms of opinion and for many of them, it may be the first time that they've heard anything different coming back to them. So I really do, I, I use a lot of discussion. And when I feel like there might be a conversation where maybe I wouldn't have an outside opinion, I have them supplement that with an article that's way out in left field, right? Let them bring that in and say, okay, well, here's your group, but you have to add this as if it were a commentator in your group. And can you respond and can you learn to, 
to to communicate in that dynamic in to to figure out you know what are your ways of knowing and how do i practice communicating within that setting yeah good timing let's take it out there <laughs> my field is media journalism where we have absolutely nothing to do with facts <laughs> 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 I take this one because I've got yeah. to step Peter's, out for another obligation. Peter's got to leave right away. Um, so sure. Setting expectations, I think, is probably one of the most critical things we do in our conversations with students. And so when we talk about truth, it can mean different things to different people. And so at least from my perspective, when we talk about what truth is, well, there is truth as in this is an event that happened. We have a recorded history of it. These are the facts on the ground. This is truth. Or are you talking about this is truth, meaning I am trying to make some kind of judgment or moral decision based off of personal experience, mm -hmm. and so my truth is now subjective. And I think helping my students recognize the differences in what truth can be to a person and how to apply it in the context of their situation is a critical part of helping them understand um, what is truth in any given situation. Because truth, from a moral standpoint, can definitely be on a continuum based off of my own personal experiences and the kinds of things that I have been exposed to. Truth from uh, this is what happened, this is the day it happened, these are the people who were involved, these are the events that took place, I can't change that. I might not agree with it, I might disagree with the events that happened, but it happened. It's objectively true. And I think helping my students recognize that when we talk about truth, they need to understand what kind of truth we're discussing is, is the first step in ensuring that do we have truth as a fixed point, or is this truth on a continuum? So I don't know if that's useful, but I, I apologize. I do have to step out. Oh, sorry, Harrison. But, but yeah, you should make your other. Wait, thanks for coming. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Sorry. I hope I want to hit the button. I'll grab it. I'll grab it. I'll grab it. Okay. I, <clears throat> warning, 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 philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> I hate the term subjective truth. I don't even know what it means. <laughs> I think it's an oxymoron. Right? Like, truth is what corresponds, ordinary use of the term, I mean, it would be helpful to define our term. And ordinarily, when we say truth, we mean that which corresponds with the real. And so, truth and reality are closely bound together. Plato uses them almost synonymously. My claim is true. Claim X is true if it corresponds to some real state of affairs in the world, right? Which means there is no such thing as subjective truth. And objective truth is just redundant. 
<laughs> right? Is, truth has to do with the real. And here's my concern about this, especially for people in the humanities and social sciences, frankly, is when we distinguish between objective truth, we usually mean measurable, quantifiable, scientifically demonstrable. And then we say subjective truth for all of that squishy, touchy, feely crap that they do in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. <laughs> but, but, and then what do we hope to do in the College of Humanities? So learn to teach people the critical thinking skills. But philosophy is not the love of critical thinking. It's the love of wisdom. So Peter kept saying, well, I have morality. That's subjective. No, it isn't. There's a wide range of beliefs about what is moral, and so people disagree. But the mere fact of a disagreement doesn't mean that the truth is subjective. It just means it's a type three question. It's hard to sort out. Mm -hmm. My worry is, though, is this. Is even using the term subjective truth aborts the purpose of the university and whole departments and, and colleges within the university before it's even taken, even undertaken by the student. Do they know this is just a matter of opinion? No, it's a question of judgment. You can judge well and you can judge poorly. You can judge truly and you can judge falsely, right? So I guess, how would, have, would you all, any of you who've said subjective truth, define your terms and see if you share my concern? I'd be happy to take you on, Harrison. <laughs> Not for the first time, right? <laughs> Well, when this conversation was set up, I assumed that, in essence, the difference is methodology. That So though I'm teaching history of religion, the methodology of most religions is not to encourage the application of rigor to the acceptance of the, pro the first proposition. So we don't usually say we will find out if there is a God before we assert that there is a God. You know, maybe Aristotle did, but most people don't do it that way. So that's what I'm talking about. Subjective is a sort of knowledge that, that you have almost untested, but it, it is your, your knowledge. Now, what I'm doing as a historian is a different kind of test with a different kind of evidence. And so that's, that's why I talk about it as a scientific system because it's a, it's a way of knowing that depends upon certain kinds of evidence that is tested in certain reliable ways according to the discipline. So the students may have subjective knowledge because they have it in that untested way and I'm saying what I'm talking about is something that is, that is derived by the use of a particular kind of method. And it doesn't mean that the subjective knowledge doesn't change because of the objective or whatever we call this thing. Or, and maybe you also don't understand the objective in the study of religion until you understand about that subjective piece. So they, they, they are in conversation with each other, but they are actually different ways of knowing something. Now, truth, there's the big T and there's the little T, and we can argue about that forever. But I think they're, they're, we in the academy are about saying, given this little thing that we are studying, we have a methodology that you need to understand to, because if you don't understand the methodology, you don't understand what it is, why it is. We're deriving what we derive, which, which you know, that's people who, who practice religion don't necessarily have to have the same tests as the people who practice history. So that's the distinction that I would draw. Other people want to respond to anything Harrison had to say? <laughs> Philosophers believe in truth. It's a very strange thing. Well, engineers kind of do too, right? I mean, something that bothers me, I, um, I hear people saying, well, I'm a, I'm a believer in global warming. I mean, it's not like you get a choice of believing in it. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So what I see is that this issue of subjective knowledge and moving over into the scientific field, and it, and, you know, it doesn't become yeah, I I never use the word subjective truth. That's not. I mean, I talk about it, but I don't tell them that's what it is. And you know, a lot of things that we, whether it's climate change or evolution, you know, we talk about 
you can choose not to agree with what the science tells us. I mean, this is these are the facts. These are these are the obvious conclusions from math and science that we bring together and here's what it says. And you can choose not to buy into that for whatever reason, but that's not that you believe in that. That's you know something else, right? I mean, this is what it is. And so how you denial. feel about that, yeah, you can be in de- you can be in a form of denial and I'm not a philosopher by any sense of the word. So I don't want to get too deep into a grave I will dig for myself. But I, but yeah, we don't talk about, I don't bring it up in that way. I talk about, you know, there are aspects that are really messy. And when you make ethical, um, or excuse me, when you make a moral decision, it could be based on this, or you could be thinking in this particular way. And this, that could be because of this bias, or it could be because of this experience that you had. And that's okay. That's how you formulate the questions that you bring to the conversation. But when we talk about what is a theory, what is objective, what is what can be proven, what can be peer reviewed, what can be brought into replication and corroborated by other scientists, Mm -hmm. that's where the rubber hits the road. And you either buy into that or you don't. And that doesn't always sit well with people. And I've had students stand up and say, this is a load of, you know, in my class, because they are angry that that doesn't become what their perception or what their, what feeds their bias or what feeds their, you know, their perception. And I say, that's fine. Would you like to tell me why you feel that way? Or, you know, where did you, what other information do you have to bring? And I would say nine times out of 10, they don't have information to bring to the story, they just don't like what's being said, right? As that relates to their perception. So yeah, I see that, I see it a lot. And I get comments on evaluations and everything else that I'm, but that's because they struggle with exactly what you're saying, where they feel like they have to believe that this is, no, no. You can choose to deny the facts or you can choose not to like what the facts are, but that's not, that doesn't change the facts. That can become your personal philosophy. Okay, fine. Totally fine with that. But that's not how we talk about it there. So in terms of a science class and subjective truth, no, that is not, that's not a term that I use with them. But I think that goes in any class. We're going to just yeah. add one thing. I'll be very quick. I just don't think subjective and objective is the best framing for our students. I think the best framing for our students is every department in the university is interested in truth. There's different modes of inquiry, and different modes of inquiry are going to have different levels of precision mm-hmm. in how they can articulate truth. But the historian is just as interested in truth as the philosopher, who's just as interested in truth as the engineer, who's just as interested in truth as the chemist. They have different methods and mm-hmm. modes of inquiry, which allow for different degrees of precision. But it's not objective subjective. It's different ways of articulating truth, expressing truth, and taking truth. Like it's a like much more. Idea. That in part that touches on the hidden curriculum problem. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. Because, really. because as soon as it's objective, of course, the scientist in the white coat knows all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> none just, of us. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I just wanted to quickly add because I'm in this these two opposite worlds, engineering and education. In my, I have another class that I teach, um, and uh, it's qualitative methods for engineers, which is really interesting. <laughs> um, but I talk about rigor, right, and and how rigor is different for the quote-unquote hard sciences and how it's different for um, the soft sciences, but it's still rigorous, right? It's just as rigorous. It's just different ways of, of, of addressing that rigor. And I apologize. I actually have to go. So, yeah. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you so Thanks. much. Chuck? Uh, just an interesting conversation. I don't want to get into the subjective, objective, truth, whatever. Uh, just to mention that my focus is
with whatever truth they come to. That's one thing that I've seen to a lot of balance in scientific evidence would lead one to do this. But I still don't believe that my truth is still not that. Uh, you know, and so rather than getting into this debate, I think that a lot of it has to do with uh, teaching students to sort through mm -hmm. and be able to identify the type of evidence and recognize these things and then realize uh, and then again with this, and, 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 uh, one of my pet peeves is the students, graduates, who are telling me, man, if you throw in the good, or better, or anything, or, or thing in an abstract, it, 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 it's way out. I said, it's lower, it's higher, it's more, it's less. It's not good, good and better, you know, being a good fit. It's just, it's a very interesting conversation, but I appreciate how you found it. And I think what Peter said in conjunction with your comment was really important that if you find evidence, at some point we hope that you can have the moral courage yeah. to change your mind, which is also something we talk about, that it is really difficult to change somebody's mind, especially once they've formulated scientific misconceptions, because, boy, we cling. That's who we are. We see ourselves as this particular, and I have these principles, and I have built my self based on these principles. And so even if, it's, even if we find out that it's totally wrong, Finding that courage to make a, ch ch a change in how we think and how we act or how we reflect on that information yeah, is. Yeah, I throw out that we don't find it totally wrong. We may find that the evidence yeah. is inconsistent, or the scientific evidence is inconsistent with my truth. Well, yeah. that's one thing. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, when we send our graduate students out into the business world, they're going to be faced with a slew of consultants uh, that want to sell, sell them this new technique. And I'm sure this applies to food science and many other places. Uh, and the consultants are going to be uh, citing scientific data, internal studies, and this ability to, A, uh, be good consumers of science broadly, published science in the journals, and also uh, good consumers and question asker, askers uh, to be able to evaluate the claims that they're making and whether this is going to be right for them. So it doesn't quite, quite tie into Harrison's notion of subjective truth, uh, but that people are going to be sending you, they're going to be giving you messages, information that's not quite true, uh, and it's going to be your job. What My job in the classroom, I think, is to try to teach them to be better consumers of the consultants and others that are going to try to get them to buy and do things. So I really like this idea of, of Engineering, engineers being as interested in the field as philosophers. And there's something I really think is secure in this idea that, that you want a well made bridge, right? So that an engineer who knows how to make a bridge rather than making a, a bridge that, that they believe in. Whereby to know that the bridge is down. We all have we all have interest in this, right? But unfortunately, we live in a society where it's not the most well-made bridge that gets crossed. But often it's the most well-marketed bridge that, that gets crossed. Make and bridges great question. again. Make <laughs> bridges <laughs> great again. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of a, I don't mean to be statistic, uh, and it's a provocative question, but as certain bridges of, of religion or bridges of national policy or bridges of uh, a demagogic cult or whatever, as they get populated with people who believe the market is coming and, and ultimately collapse, and, and the people fall in the river below and are just given in the traffic. Is there a certain satisfaction in that happening? Is, is that a good thing for society, for the people who, you know, we spend so much time trying to educate our students to, to do their research before they get on the bridge, because we realize that, that, that there's a of not doing so. Are we satisfied with this with this confidence that you know when it comes to there and the confidence is that sort of a natural selection? Yeah. Natural selection. <laughs> Divine <laughs> providence. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, and just to clarify, is that in the policy perspective or in the or in the, the scientific think, decision of what bridge should we build at this time with these materials? I, I think the policy is probably the most right yeah. yeah. well, as a metaphor. I mean, we talk about the hidden curriculum, and I think that there are actually two hidden curriculums. One of them is the one that 
you know, we're foisting our students. The other one is that we're not telling our students about, which is we are in the business in the university of teaching our students to think. And to ask that question about bridges, I mean, we, we say we teach critical thinking. All of us do teach critical thinking, but we don't make that clear to our students that this is the preparation for whether or not you cross the bridge. Uh, and we probably ought to be a little more intentional about making sure that, because if, you know, one of the standard criticisms of what we do is that, that we teach people not to believe things. Well, yeah, we do. That's right, because of this bridge problem. Uh, so why shouldn't we be honest with our students about we are teaching you to ask hard questions using the appropriate tools to make sure you don't get on the wrong bridge? Rob? Well, first of all, I totally love the, I don't believe in the bridge, or I do, and I'm completely going to steal that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to make that point. I'm wondering if there's a way to maybe work into our strategy the notion of not, someone, I can't remember who, I'm sorry, mentioned this notion of connecting identity to belief. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if we can instead switch it to connect identity to process. So that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And really, we work hard at this in the, in the sciences to do that, to, to not get attached to, to your personal theory. You have, a, you have something you want to test. Maybe you have a way that you want it to turn out. If it doesn't, um, we work hard at being okay with that. And, that's, and I can be okay with that because it was a reasonable thing to test. Mm -hmm. It was a reasonable question to ask. Um, and maybe there was even evidence for me to believe this for a while that this might be true, but now I see it's not. And that doesn't change my view of myself. And so it's easy for me to back away from it. I don't, I'm not, I often get um, told that I'm very passionate <laughs> about my science. And my response is always actually very rational. I don't believe I'm irrationally attached to the result. And I just wonder if that comes in not to believe in the process of getting there. So that it's okay to release it. So, you know, I, I wasn't unreasonable to, to think that this was true for a while. Now I see it's not. And I don't have personal identity needs that are keeping me from that. I'm wondering if that's a pathway for our students. Because of course we can see that in our society this is what is running up the years. I would say, I mean, my personal opinion is that it's possible, but unlikely, right? If you, to me, when I listen to all the panelists, I hear this great discussion of rigor and methods. And, and I, I say this without trying to be funny or sarcastic, but I had never thought about a qualitative research class in engineering. It makes perfect sense. I'm not trying to be funny. Uh, and hear about historical methods. We're all across the, the panel. Uh, and we teach our students these methods, right? They have to... Uh, sit in the lecture, take the test, demonstrate it, use it in the lab, do a thesis on that. Uh, but it seems as though we, we, you know, we grant them degrees, we certify them, we give them diplomas, uh, but the minute they leave, they're going to go back. And so I, I'm not trying to be you know, argumentative, but I'm not sure what we can do to make them continue to use the processes that we teach them, uh, even though that's the, the right way, and it will lead to the outcomes that are broadly better for better for society. So I'm just I, I said that on a pessimistic note and, and look forward to being corrected. <laughs> yeah, Norm? It seems like in our in, in my sense so that in engineering is civil and environmental engineering, I mean the process is really critical. They have a hard time, for example, dealing with the fact that they don't get to make the decision. Their job is to give the client a variety of different options, recommend something that they think is the best. But unless they're paying for it, they don't get to choose. And that's a really hard thing for them to deal with. And it's the process. They, they're going to pay to do the process. What I think happens, I don't see them doing that, that same process in their own lives. I certainly see them doing that in their profession. But I don't think that there is over to do But I make a big deal about talking about the difference between professional ethics and their own personal ethical 
moral okay. I don't care what they think from a person's standpoint. If they want to be an engineer, there's a set of rules that they are they have to work by. And if they don't want to work by that, they should try to get another thing. So I think maybe some of that disconnect in the process. Yeah, well, Ryan, that's why your students have to take the humanities. That's why your students have to take the humanities and arts. Because yeah, yeah, that, that, this is the, the piece where you ask yourself, why do I think this way? If this is who I am, why do I think this way? Because you, you've got to understand yourself in the context. Rob, we all know you believe in science. Why? <laughs> so. I think well, this is one of the things I was hoping would come out of the panel, is the connection between what's done in the gen ed curriculum, what's done in all those courses, and what's done in the majors. And this is just a perfect example of how the two can get connected. But it's hard to do, because those of us who are teaching in the majors have relatively little exposure to, to what's really be do, being done in the gen ed curriculum on any kind of a fine grain. So how can we build on it? And I think in general, Can I just add one thing before? I'm sorry, Tim. Okay. I think what was interesting about, I really would like to explore that more. I might have to think about that, Rob, for a while, about investing in the process. What I find what's really interesting with my students is that I don't know that they have a lot of faith in their ability to create change within the process. I find that they mm -hmm. kind of think about, well, in school, the process works for me because I'm in this class and I've got to do X, Y, and Z. And then I get out into the world, but I find that they, they are very uncertain about how real life happens. And I don't, you know, I don't teach graduate level, and so, and within the scope of my class, that's not something I can explore. But I do find that they, they feel like they're not sure that they can affect change or that their, their ability to change would affect the process or how do I get people to get off the bridge even if I know it's dangerous, right? So I don't know. I'd have to think about that more, but I think it's well, worth exploring. Process, I mean their own process, they've gone through to come to a conclusion. Yeah. 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 And maybe that's the, maybe that's the point, is to emphasize that more. The example yeah. life. Yeah. 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 Yes. It might help to make that explicit across yes. very different kinds yeah. of uh, contexts. Yeah. Nope. Matt, did you? Your hand up. Oh, yeah, just a quick thought about, and I had a neighbor tell me, ask me, what's the difference between major and minor surgery? Major is when it's on you and minor is when it's on you. And uh, I just wonder about bias, because we talk about like, how 
how we help our students do this, but we carry around those things and mm-hmm. we're all human beings. How, how do you as an instructor engage in this process but also look at yourself to make sure that you're not you're not engaging in the same problem that we're you're kind of discussing and worry about my mm-hmm. That's part of I, I think some of it is the openness with which you respond to different points of view. Right? I mean, I, I think I, I can appreciate what was said earlier about you know, your, your opinion doesn't matter, but I think that when you're dealing with an 18 to a 22 year old, that's a strong message to send. It, so there's, I think, a, the opportunity to shut down, right? And to create a, a closed perception and, and that sort of notion. So, sorry, colleague. For, for saying that, but I, I get the sense that there are there are ways that we can be more, I think, inviting to these young people, and I think that that allows them to to toil more with the questions that we want them to. So that, to me, is some of the modeling. And I, I think part of that modeling too is being open about the process, especially for like lower division students. Mm-hmm. We we know all. I mean, right? You're a scientist, right? <laughs> <laughs> And it gets delivered that way, and you make them buy the textbook. Uh, if you invite them into the intellectual process of discovery from the very beginning, then it's you, you have to say, well, this is how I'm doing it, and, and this is how you can do it too. And that helps dampen some of that, I am the scientist and I know more than you do kind of a thing. One, one of the things, and, and I don't know if this apply, this won't apply to everyone, but just to, to directly answer your question, uh, one of the classes I teach is labor and employee relations. So I teach the students how companies uh, interact with unions, how unions are formed in union, union history. Uh, as a, not every business professor is this way, but many business professors like myself, I'm not a fan of unions. I don't like unions. And we can have a side discussion if anyone wants to, to do that off to the side. Uh, but I was very worried that my biases were going to come through in the classroom. My goal is not to uh, have my political and personal opinions about unions come through and affect the students in the classroom. Uh, so I talked to my department chair about this. This was a few years ago. Uh, and what I ended up doing was I gave my students uh, a quick survey before the start of class, which was to measure their, at their time their perceptions, their positivity or negativity towards labor unions in the United States. And then the other element of the question was how how confident were they in those opinions? And then uh, I administered the same survey at the end of the semester. Uh, and the result I'm proud to report is that their perceptions, negative, positive on unions, did not change at all. And the confidence in their opinions went up. It wasn't dramatic, but it was a <laughs> statistically significant increase. And I've only done that one time. I wish I'd done it more. But I felt like what that did and what it continues to do is to make sure that I uh, present both sides. We talk about uh, what Republicans do when they control the National Labor Relations Board and what the Democrats do when they control the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, they know, uh, I'm very explicit of where my position is, that I don't like unions, uh, but I bring in a union president. We talk about the history. We, they understand why and how they formed. And so I feel like the testing was fine. It allows me to brag in seminars like this. Uh, but it also uh, keeps me honest in what I'm saying and, and what I'm doing and those biases at the top of my mind. Yes, last. We, we talk about <clears throat> critical thinking, and that seems to be. Oh, I remember a brown bag lunch when I was in graduate school, where they're telling you how to, how to go to the interview. I'm sure, when they ask what, what you're teaching, I believe in student centered teaching. <laughs> <laughs> so the committee checks that off. He's now done that. Um, um, I, I look at, at dogma, and I teach my students skepticism, not critical thinking, curiosity, and skepticism. Mm-hmm. Um, Anybody knows anything about uh, naval design? A few years ago, they were designing new uh, Coast Guard cutters, and they decided to save to save fuel to make an aluminum alloy hull. Sounds great. They did all the engineering; everything was correct. Stuck it out in the middle of Lake Michigan, where they were testing like that, and they were getting cracks all over them because no one had thought outside the box to think that. It works in a constantly moving, shifting all dimensions at once. And at some point, even though everything works fine, it's going to somehow change when it gets real world application. What did, uh, uh, for instance, what did um, Sir Isaac Newton spend most of his life working on? 
Alchemy. Alchemy. Changing lead into gold. Plus gravity. <laughs> and revealed religion. <laughs> all right, maybe that brings it all together. <laughs> <laughs> Ever, this was such a good discussion. Thanks very much.